Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, a vintage online tube store. And today in tube lot number 44, we're going to learn how to repair tube bases and look at some really high demand power tubes that came in. The Svetlana 6550Cs finally are back in stock in, as quads. But first, Caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Last week we talked about socket savers and how they could help keep your vintage octal tubes safe. When using modern amps like the Freya and Wilsonton that have sunken tube sockets mounted on PCBs, this can be a huge problem because you can get your vintage tube into the amp fairly safely just by pushing down, but when you go to get them out, you can't get your fingers on the base. So you're grabbing the glass and you're, you you got to wiggle in to get them out and that's a big no-no. It'll break the glue bond as, as quick as can be on vintage tubes and even on new tubes it's a problem. And in a minute, we'll actually talk about how to fix that glue bond if you've got some loose bases. But let's take a look at socket savers first quickly because this is really a solution. Now, with these old style deep bases, and a lot of vintage tubes have them, a lot of the octals, socket savers are wonderful because take a look. Straight in. Now, load your vintage tubes outside of the amp and then put the whole assembly in, just like that. Sometimes when you pull them out, you'll get the whole thing out, because these are fairly tight, at least on my socket savers, and you want tight. In fact, let's look at those quickly. Now, pulling them out, you wiggle, you hold the base, right? Not the glass. You wiggle back and forth a little bit, and you pull out. Now, these were brand new, <laughs> so they are snug. They loosen up, though, after a little while, and they become... Uh, much easier to use. It takes about a dozen ins and outs and then they start loosening up to the point where they're not so stiff or tight. Take a look at the receivers. Aren't they lovely? See how they're how they're made with all the little gaps all the way around? So they open up to receive the tube and then they clamp tight. That's what you want. You want a good tight electrical connection, right? Okay. What about Vintage tubes with shallow bases, well, these are even more dangerous, right? Because this, the plastic will be right below the top completely. You can't get your finger on it at all. In fact, um, this is actually one of my favorite um, Canadian uh, 6SN7, the Marconi tube. Marconi, in case you didn't know, had a huge factory in Montreal. My father grew up in Montreal, and as a boy, he'd walk by it every once in a while, and he told me, it was four large city blocks square. So it's, that's probably a mile square. Imagine a factory that big. Now, they weren't just making vacuum tubes. Marconi was right in the very invention of radio, telegraph, um, and a whole bunch of stuff to do with early electronics. And um, so they would have been making radios in that factory and maybe phonographs. I'm not sure but they definitely had a tube factory in there. And um, these are just, they had a GT version, the earlier version of the 6SN7, and they made the 6SN7 GTB, the modern version as well. And they have a lot of rebrands. Uh, same tube, <laughs> the rebranding was a thing. Sylvania did a lot of rebranding, Marconi did a lot of rebranding, and a lot of them show up as General Electric's. And, um, and other manufacturers as well, like Westinghouse. And they're all exactly the same tube. And the thing I like about these is that they have a fair amount of top-end um, air. And what we're talking about is um, high frequencies that um, are, are... It's probably substantially... Um, uh, harmonic distortion that we're hearing, but what that does, and 
back in the day, if you're as old as I am, distortion at one time, everybody was like, get those distortion numbers down to nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> We'd be buying equipment based on just the distortion specification, 0.0001. Well, if you're into tubes, forget about that damn number because tubes give us, um, they give us uh, pleasant distortion, even harmonics, and that's what fills in the sound. And uh, so there's there's good distortion, there's bad distortion, there's too much of a good thing, not enough of a good thing, too much of a bad thing. So, anyways, um, so what you get with a bit of air in the top end is a sense of of a live presentation, and a fair number of the really good quality 6S and 7s have that feature, and a lot of them are elevated. See that elevated black T-plate? Does that remind you of a couple of other tubes? Ah, well I didn't bring out the melts, but it should remind you of the melts, one of the, one of the best of the vintage tubes, and this is a Sylvania bad boy. Unfortunately it's a dead tube, and we're going to use it to show how to re-glue bases in a minute. And um, it's got the same elevated black T-plate. In fact, I think the Marconi actually was the first generation, the first manufacturer to come up with that. I've never seen an older version than the Marconi. So they may have licensed Sylvania, and Sylvania may have bootlegged the design or changed it enough that they could just go ahead and build it outside of the patent rules. I don't know the truth of, of that story. Maybe someday somebody will throw something in the comments. Okay, so what happens if you've got a loosened up base? Well, you glue it together, of course. Now, here's an example of one that's a tough one to do. This is a shoulder tube. This is actually the uh, 6P7S in English, or 6N7C in Cyrillic in Russian. And the shoulder tubes are hard because you can't get your glue tip in tight. Now, this is what I've done here. And when they're finished, if they're a little bigger than you like, you got to let these things dry overnight, but once you dry, get in here with a sharp knife and just make a little cut line where you want to get rid of the extra glue and just snap it off. Just scrape it back. If there's extra glue that you've left behind, just carefully scrape it back and then jump in with your favorite rag with some isopropyl alcohol on it and just wipe it off. In fact, I should show you my stuff. This is what I use. It's 99% pure alcohol. And what I do is I um, is I I use I blend half half the bottle down with filtered water. So I end up with a with a 50% alcohol, 50% water solution. I put a couple of drops of dish soap in, and this is my general cleaner for tubes, a safe cleaner. It's also a good general cleaner around um, the tube lab. When I'm building stuff. So you'll find that if you let this glue dry, stand up your tube sort of on an angle so that the, the glue can settle in. If you let it dry overnight, you'll get a blush. The alcohol will take that blush off. Look at split. Okay, let's put that away. So how do we go about it? Now, and when do we have to glue tubes? Take a look at this. Can you hear that? So it's a little loose. You could leave this. It would be perfectly fine. What we're really concerned about is, is a complete looseness in which the electrical wires, the connections from the glass to the pins, in which they can actually move a fair amount. Now you can you can wreck your tube really quick if you, if you have a loose tube like that. It can be dangerous. You can have a short, a bad short, a dead short. Um, so you don't use a tube like that, fix it, and then test it to make sure that it's working properly. Okay, so when I first started repairing tube bases, I'd, I'd go and I'd buy those little gel caps you can get at the dollar store, and they're cheap, but they leave a terrible amount of blush after the glue dries. Next up, I tried this straight Gorilla Glue without the thickener, without the gel, and it works fine for big jobs, but the nozzle's big. And then I found this this new product on the shelf, at least to me, 
in which they advertise the fine nozzle. And of course they charge more for the product. But this, this is what I like to use. So let's get to it. Now, have a look around. Make sure you've cleaned the... I've already got the rag soaked. Make sure you clean around that base properly. If, if you've got um, a deep bit of garbage in there that you want out, just get one of these. This is a bamboo toothpick. I love these in the shop. Just get in there and clean it out. Now, look around. There will be a one, often with the older tubes, there will be a gap that's larger on one spot. And there it is, right there. Can you see it? Now, this is a dead tube, so we're not going to worry too much about stuff. Now, i got a little drip on the tip, so let's get rid of that. Now, be careful using crazy glue. I, I would lock it up if I had kids in the house. This stuff is dangerous. Now, if you're not a neat person, like me, <laughs> wear gloves um, and be careful. So, just get it, get your nozzle right in there and just let the glue flow. Don't squeeze hard. You just want a little bit to flow. See how it's just filling in the gap? Now, if I could have, I would have gone on the other side of the label. But this is where the gap was. So that's where I'm going to glue. Now, when I first started doing this, now while it's drying, you can wiggle it back and forth a little bit. That and hold it up. That helps helps get the glue to wiggle down a little bit into the joint. That's where you want it. You don't want it outside on the surface. That's not doing us any good. And it's just starting to tighten up and boom, that's all it takes. Let's get the cap on that, make it safe. Now, when I first started doing this, I put a little spot on each side, and that looks beautiful. You can't see it. Uh, unfortunately, though, because tubes expand and contract really uh, quite a bit, um, we've got dissimilar surfaces, right? We've got plastic and we've got glass. So they, sh they move with, with increasing temperature and decreasing temperatures at a different rate, and they'll bust a little tiny glue joint lickety split. So I've come up with sort of a balance. I don't go all the way around. It's too much potential to make a mess. So I go about a quarter of the way around, maybe a third on a, a big gap, and I call it done. Now if there's a really large gap all the way around, I'll do about a quarter on each side. Figure out what works best for the particular tube that you're gluing. Take your time. Do it. Do it carefully. Now set it aside. I like to do these in the evening. Set it aside overnight, standing up somewhere safely, leaning slightly back like that. And what that'll do is any loose, any unglue, <laughs> any glue that's not quite dry, uh, will go down and into the into the joint, which is where you want it, right? If you store, if it falls over on the side, it actually will flow out a bit and make a hell of a mess. Okay. And then the next day, get your alcohol out, clean off the blush. And uh, if you need to, you don't always need to, but if you need to, make that little cut line and trim back um, trim back the excess glue. And then get in with the alcohol and just clean it up. It's amazing how good it can look when you're done. I've seen some really, trust me, I've seen some really bad glue jobs. And this is about as nice a job as I can come up with. And have the bond hold. Okay, a, um, a whole bunch of these Svetlanas came in. Now, if you've been watching Tube Lab, you know this is one of my favorite tubes. And I actually should have brought out the reproduction. There's a reissue. There's a reissue to all sorts of um, desirable tubes. In fact, if you want to know if a vintage tube is a good tube, <laughs> look at the reissue market. See what new sensors got, uh, which mullards they've reissued, which gold lions, which Svetlanas. And the original, those are great tubes. The reissues, eh, not so much. <laughs> They're not actually trying to make the exact tube. They're just trying to make them look like the, the original tube. Um, none of them sound like the... I mean, the reissue Mullard doesn't sound anything like the original Mullard. It has a nice box, and it has a nice logo that duplicates the original, but it's not any... It's, it's just... 
it's it's a decent quality Russian tube is what it is with a nice you know old old label so how to tell these apart they actually use the same bloody labels so the date helps you because not long after 2000 production ceased um, at SED that's Svetlana electronic devices in St. Petersburg Russia the new plant well the plant where the reissues are all made is in Saratov much different place far far away so to tell them apart the reissues have round ports and don't, they don't have these really nice punches where the welds are done on the plate joint they do have basically the same tube body though same glass same nice metal base same plastic even the dome with a little dimple is exactly the same now reason I really like the Svetlana 6550C, not the B, the B is an earlier version that had uh, reliability issues and the market's just filled with those garbage tubes and of course they're cheap. Um, but the reason I like these is that the KT88 type as a whole in general tends to have a fairly flat mid-range. They've got great base and good punch because they're good high-powered tubes but the mid-range is it's a little lacking. And if you're like me, uh, a lot of my music, in fact, most people are listening, their music's mostly centered in the mid-range. But if you'd like to listen to um, a lot of vocals, um, you're going you're gonna to want to have the EL34 type, or you're going to want to have a crossover tube, which is what this is. So my noon hour concert is often um, music on ECM by Anwar Braham, a uh, Tunisian world jazz artist and um, it's almost all acoustic and it's just it's just lovely music and the mid-range really needs that richness and this tube does it it delivers okay now for a couple of months I've been putting together trying to put together quads and all I ended up with is pairs let's here I'll show you hang on a second let's just clear out some stuff change over next scene so when I make quads it actually starts off with a single tube that I make up as a pair so here's a pair and here's a pair actually it's well it doesn't matter they're actually so closely matched it's hard to figure out but I'll I'll come up with a pair and I'll have a whole bunch of pairs and then what I do is I match pairs together right and that makes a quad Sometimes people need six tubes a side, 12 tubes and an amp. Can you imagine? That's a lot harder to do. It's hard enough to match quads. Anyways, I ended up with enough quads this, this round, this, with this new inventory that I put a couple of quads in, under the KT88 section, just on their own, and I put a couple of quads under the Wilsonton tube package. And they have been really popular. It's been impossible to keep them in stock. So they'll be in there until they're gone. There's more stock always coming in. But I just never know. It took months to get quads again. And I still have lots of match pairs. So it might not be that hard to get, um, to get match quads. Okay. Now, because I'm working hard on getting the kits together. And in fact, actually... My son is now um, becoming a big part of the business. So welcome aboard, Charles. Um, his his profession is computers, and um, the poor guy. He's I think he's working a full week in his computer business, and he's probably doing a full shift in valves and more as well. And he's working on the kits um, basically full time. He's working on finding vintage tubes for us as well. And um, eventually, I hope you'll you'll be able to meet Charles. He's a great guy. Okay. And for the kits, we've got parts coming in constantly, in huge quantities. Let's grab a few and take a look. Capacitors are a really critical part of any um, amplifier. And um, these are Nishikon. These are actually little bypass capacitors. I think I've got some. Yeah, here they are get up really close they're hard to see they're tiny there we go they're on focus they're just little guys 22 microfarad uh, I think these are 63 or 50 volts 
63. And they just, they bypassed the cathode uh, resistor on the URI, the little single-ended power amp kit that we're working on. And it just gives, um, it gives a little bit more power and uh, it helps clean up it, it helps clean up the signal at, at the bottom end of the tube because the bypass capacitor uh, will allow any stray AC that's floating around to come right through the capacitor and, um, and exit to ground. So that's what they're doing. Let's get these out of the road. What else came in? More Nishikon capacitors. So what is that with Nishikon? Well, there are good capacitors, okay capacitors, and bad capacitors. Now, most capacitors like these, this is a filter capacitor, 33 microfarad. It's a late stage filter capacitor in my, many of my designs. So it's a critical tube to, critical tube, <laughs> looks like a tube. No, <laughs> it's a critical capacitor to keep in stock. It's getting harder and harder to find high quality um, axial capacitors, which uh, a lot of my designs need, a lot of point-to-point -point wired um, tube amps need axial capacitors in certain positions. Some we can use radial, which is when you have the leads off of one end. Anyways, this is a late stage uh, electrolytic filter capacitor. And what happens is the most of them will do the filtering job, but they cycle constantly when they're in service. So they have a lot of um, work to do because they're constantly loading up a charge and letting it go. And as a result, their lifespan is relatively short compared to, let's say, a resistor, which has a very long lifespan. So the better quality, higher spec versions of these uh, capacitors have a longer life and they'll work properly for a much longer time. That's why it's worthwhile investing in um, well-made capacitors such as the Nishikon. There are other high quality capacitors out there that I also buy and install in my amps and I try to stay away from the generic stuff as much as possible because you just don't know. And of course these cost you know two and three times as much as the generic stuff. And here are some large Nishikon filter capacitors. These are the main filter capacitors in the URI uh, that's coming hopefully in the fall the little single-ended power amp. And these are big. These are um, these are 470 microfarad, 450 volts. And you need a nice big um, filter capacitor in a single-ended amp to clean up the, the noise on the B+. You know, the noise coming off of the, uh, off the power supply. What else? Oh yeah, I wanted to show you. Hang on a second, they're here somewhere. There. Where are they? Stuff gets moved around and, oh, here they are. Sorry, folks. A whole bunch of my, one of my very favorite 12AU7s came in. Now, look at that con. Let's see if I can find one with a better label. There you go. I think that might be Contel Connecticut telephone, but I'm not sure. And it, if you know your tubes, you'll recognize this orangish, reddish print that doesn't hold, doesn't stick where the darn on tubes. Yep, you guessed it. These are RCA 12AU7 clear domes, and they are wonderful 12AU7s. They have got, um, they do everything well. But what they excel at is in the high frequencies and the treble. They have a lot of air and sparkle. We were just talking actually about a 6SN7 that has a lot of air. And of course the 12AU7 is essentially a modern 6SN7 in a small envelope. In fact, they're so close electrically, not they're not identical tubes, but they are they are a general 6SN7 or general 12AU7, and they're very close. And they're, so, they're actually so close you can utilize, in most cases, the same circuit for either one. Different socket, of course. Um, but that, that top end sparkle is just delightful. And a whole bunch of these came in. The date codes are mostly intact. Here's a good seller. In his 
add, he said, I don't clean my tubes and wipe off the labels and the date codes. <laughs> he just leaves it to me to carefully clean them, which is fine because I want those date codes. I am not going to be wiping around that. This, If you were to take your alcohol blend and hit that label, it would be off in seconds. Trust me on this. And don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> Anyways, a whole bunch of these came in the store. This round that will be in this weekend are are used, they're testing nice and high, but I was lucky enough to find a whole bunch new old stock new in the box, NOS, NIB, and I've never seen a uh, clear top that was uh, new in the box. So we'll have an unboxing hopefully next Friday. Now how do we get a clear top? Well we put the getter somewhere else. Now on a miniature nine pin I don't think you can physically put it at the bottom. There's not enough room like on an octal tube, which is a common place on early octals. Look at the silvering on the side or gettering. So that's where your getter is. I don't know if you can see it. They're hard to see. They're basically spot, spot welded onto the side of the plate and bent over. And that of course leaves the dome clear. I don't know if a clear dome has anything to do with how great these tubes sound but maybe it does. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly unusual feature on a 12AU7, and these are unusually good sounding 12AU7s. Okay, well, that was fun. If you stay to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world, and free shipping of 100, on, um, on orders of $150 or more after discount. Stay safe everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers everyone.